Hey, Pastor Steve here. Thank you for joining us today. Get your Bibles and open up to Revelation chapter 20 is where we're going to be as we talk about this world and how it's going to end, but how we as believers in Jesus Christ can be optimistic. There is hope. The world is crazy. It gets worse every day. But as believers, we have optimism. We have hope. So get your Bibles ready and let hope you enjoy. <laughs> This week I did a little experiment. I took a screenshot from one of my all-time favorite shows, The Andy Griffith Show, and it's a shot of Barney standing there on a stage. The episode doesn't matter, and I asked people, forget the fact that it's Barney Fife and The Andy Griffith Show. Just looking at that photo of that lone man on an empty stage, what do you see? Some people said they saw an actor preparing their lines and getting ready because he wanted to do a good job. One person said they saw a determined man who was about to speak and what he was going to say was so important. They wanted to make sure, he wanted to make sure he got every word right. One person noticed that the man was facing a light and behind him was dark. And he said, I see it symbolically as a man turning his back on the darkness and going to the light. And one 20 something young lady said, what's the Andy Griffith show? What are they teaching kids today? I told each one of them, you know what I see? I see a pastor. I see a pastor who has given everything he had that Sunday. And it is Sunday night and there was no one there to help him straighten up the chairs. I see a man who has poured out his entire soul and he might be a little discouraged and feel alone. One of my friends came back to me and said, you know, you have a tendency sometimes to see the world, well, half empty instead of half full. Another friend said, you have this debilitating need to be recognized, don't you? Well, you know, it's amazing that our experiences really transform how we see things. Everybody who saw him as an actor had an experience in acting, had an experience on stage. The person who said they saw him turning from darkness to light was a person who went through a period in their life where they had to make a conscious decision to walk away from things that would either destroy them and turn their life to Jesus. We have a tendency to take our views and impose them on things that we see. You see, in the world today, it is a mess. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can look at the world that we see and we can see that there is no hope. But those of us who know Jesus as our personal Savior, we are never without hope. So instead of seeing disaster, instead of seeing everything that's going wrong, today I want to challenge you on why we can be optimistic, why we should be optimistic. You see, there's a lot of things going wrong today, and I, I just want to give you my three thoughts of what's going wrong today in the world. I think these are applied to Western civilization, but directly, I'm going to apply them to my home. I'm going to apply them to America. What's wrong today? Number one, the damage we are doing to children. The damage we are doing to children. What we did to children during the COVID lockdown, lockdown was borderline criminal. The teacher that we're working with at the Cross Creek Foundation pointed out that the third grade students are really, some of them at their first or kindergarten level because they left kindergarten and they basically didn't have school for two whole years. Why do drag queens need to read books to kids? Why are we sexualizing children and exposing them to sexual ideas? They are changing the name pedophilia and they're trying to change instead of pedophilia, make it maps because that sounds a little nicer, minor attracted personnels persons. And just this last week in the city of Milwaukee, the minor league hockey team, at the end of the hockey game, they had a bunch of drag queens come out, men dressed up in, like women, in women face, and they gyrated and performed in front of the crowd. And what's worse, the people that sang the national anthem before the game were still there. It was a bunch of middle school children. We are destroying a generation with drugs. Drugs that were designed to castrate sex offenders. And under the banner of inclusivity, we are ruining their lives. Secondly, the normalization of violence. What happened in Memphis by the police department was absolutely horrible and wrong. But how is it much different than, well, rap music? How is it much different than the video games and the movies that we're promoting to the same generation? Hey, when we were kids, we brought guns to school. We were told to by the teachers. And I remember going at the end of the school year and bringing our BB gun to what we called field day, one of the last days of school. And we got to shoot and, and do different things with it. You see, 
Guns haven't changed. People have changed. The world is going crazy and crazy, and it's getting more violent. You see, the prophet Hosea, he wrote to his nation that was walking away from God. But I think what he's about to say here in Hosea 4.4 could be applied directly to America. Listen to what Hosea says thousands of years ago, and it applies to us today. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. This is what a nation that walks away from God looks like. Children and seniors are not safe. It is more and more dangerous. And look at that last part of that verse. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. As cities in our nation are reporting record high murder rates, as their mayors dance in the street, we are a nation of violence. This week I saw one of the most horrific things I've ever seen as a nine-year-old girl in her school bus, a place where she should feel safe, was pummeled and beaten by two much older and bigger boys. And what's even worse is no one stepped in and stopped it, but yet many of the kids videoed it. Violence has become the normal. And lastly, what's wrong with us, what's wrong with America, the pursuit of pleasure. We have legalized drugs. We are flooding our streets with fentanyl. Thousands are dying of overdoses. But let's look at the church. The church is designed today to numb you to numb you to the reality and to give you an alternate reality of what's really going on. The American church experience is a drug. People need to repent. People need to make a change. Jesus is coming back and he's going to judge. People must be born again. But instead, the American church has focused more on entertainment. It's focused more on making you comfortable. Listen, I love padded seats. I love that the fact that many of our churches practically all have air condition and heat. What a great blessing to have. But it is not the focus and the point of any true church to make you comfortable. It is to push you towards Jesus. It is to call you to repentance. And the American church, as it plants new churches in the wealthiest possible areas, is not an institution of repentance. It is a drug that the American Christian is taking. You see, it is our responsibility to preach Jesus. This world is never gonna get perfect. And that's why that socialist utopia that many people are seeking are, is never going to happen. We've said there's three reasons why this world is the complete mess it is, and just let me remind you. First, it's a mess because the God of this world is Satan. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, our, our theme verse for this series, in whom the God of this world, this world's system, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. All of this insanity that we see on the news that's taking place in our nation is all the result of Satan and sin. Stop blaming God for what you see. Secondly, we said that Satan wants the worship of this world. But the answer, the answer is in verse five. The answer is the preaching and the focus and the praise of the church to be on Jesus. It is not our desire at Cross Creek, and it should not be the desire at any church that wants to follow Jesus to be a political organization, to be a group of do-gooders or anything or social justice movers. It is our desire to focus constantly on Jesus, a simple church simply focused on Jesus Christ. And I say to you, as the world gets crazier and crazier, the challenge for you as a believer in Jesus Christ is not to focus on the chaos. It's not to focus on the heartbreaking stories that we see. It's not even to get mad at what we're seeing. The focus is always on Jesus because Jesus died for you. He is Lord and he is coming back one day. We need Jesus. And our sim one simple truth today is this. The world has a future with Jesus. This world has a future with Jesus. We have talked about how this planet will never be destroyed. Jesus is gonna come back to it and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. We use the theological term, the millennium, and it takes place after the rapture or the removal of the church. After that seven year period of tribulation where the Antichrist rules, after the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back at the second coming from Revelation chapter 19, he will set up a thousand year reign while he literally rules here on this planet. 
Now, there's different views of what this millennia will look like. One view is the post-millennial view. It's not very popular today. It was the idea that, Jesus, that the church and, and maybe government could work together. This was sort of the spur of a lot of Christian uh, education. This is where the, a lot of the uh, prohibition and, and children's labor laws and women voting came from. It was the idea that the church and the government could work together to create a better utopia, something so great that Jesus would come back at the end and say, good job, you set this world up exactly the way I wanted it. Well, that idea kind of really took a, 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 a blow, death blow when World War I happened and it completely ended when World War II happened. Amillennialism is very popular today amongst many people, and it's really the idea that, well, all of this is really a spiritual return, and that all the promises that were made to the nation of Israel are really spiritually fulfilled in the, in the church today. As we look at passages of Scripture today, I'm going to keep asking you where and why. How did this happen? Where did this take place? Because if this is the millennium, then that means Satan is bound for a, for a thousand years in a pit. I asked that one theory to uh, an amillennialist theologian. I said, this is Satan being bound? And he said, well, he can be bound spiritually. Okay, even if he's not bound physically and is bound spiritually, everything I'm seeing on the news, this is Satan being bound? I remember he said, well, I think I'll have to think about that. And as he walked away, I would adhere to the third version. So I guess that has to be right. And that is a, a premillennial, that Jesus comes back before the millennial starts that the second coming of Jesus comes back after the tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon, and Jesus comes back with us in Revelation 19. It is all literal and physical. You, if you interpret the Bible as literal and real, then you almost have to be a premillennialist. But the greatest verses about the millennium take place in Revelation 19 and Revelation chapter 20. We said last week, I just want to remind you two things. That first, Jesus returns. Look at Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. A white horse is a, a war horse. That reminds you in Revelation 6, the Antichrist rides in on a white horse. He tries to mimic what Jesus does. And he sat upon him, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And verse 12 says, his eyes were a flame of fire. I'll ask you again, when did this happen? How is this a spiritual return? And when did Jesus do this spiritually? Second, we said last week, that Jesus returns with judgment. He returns with judgment. Look at chapter 19, one verse I'm going to point out, just one verse, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Little time out, be very careful. Just because someone does miracles doesn't mean they're of God. And wrought miracles before him. This is the false prophet and the Antichrist, which he deceived them that had mark of the beast. What is that mark? I don't really know what it's going to be. But I know that it seems like it's getting a lot closer and closer when you see news stories of Amazon wanting people to put chips in their wrists so that they can just scan over. One person was showing how that they thought they could put a tattoo and put all of your information of you on your tattoo because you know how millennials, you know, they kind of lose stuff. This would be impossible for you to lose. Wrought miracles before him which deceived them and received the mark of the beast which worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Hell is not the eternal resting place of those who reject Jesus Christ. It is the lake of fire. But even with everything I see in the world, I am optimistic. I am optimistic because Jesus will return and Jesus will take care of this world. I see these things on TV and I think, God, when will you judge? Jesus, when will you stop this? I see the, the news stories of towns being burned down. You see the, the events of people being murdered and found dead and children being abused and your heart breaks and you ask, Jesus, when, when, when? The when is right here in Revelation chapter 20. My Jesus comes back and he sets everything right. So I want to challenge you today to be optimistic. Be optimistic as we break down Revelation chapter 21. Number one, be optimistic because Jesus will remove the serpent. Jesus will remove the usurpent. The usurper must be removed. That is what Satan is. He is a usurper. He is trying to usurp and rule this world like 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us. How can Jesus physically rule this planet if the usurper Satan is still here? 
Satan, by the way, Satan is not God. He does not know everything. He is not all present everywhere. He is a fallen angel. He has a specific place he can be and he can only know so much. So Satan probably doesn't know your name and he is probably not even in places like our neighborhoods. He probably lives in places like Washington, D.C. and London and Moscow. And that is where he manipulates people to do things. What's going to happen here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1? Well, to, to use the phrase of one person, Jesus is literally going to drain the swamp here. So look at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. Second Peter talks about an abyss that some of the demons that rebelled against God were put in. There's also an abyss in Jesus' telling of the events of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man went to hell and then in the other compartment, what we call paradise, Abraham's bosom, there was a gulf that was separated in them. I don't know if that's where this is. I don't know if that's the abyss. I guess in the end, it really doesn't matter. What matters is Satan is going there for a thousand years and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Amen. Till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So again, my question would be repeatedly, when did this happen? How has this happened spiritually? If this is the millennium, then where is this pit that Satan is bound to? This is the world free of Satan. I see the events of September 11th, human trafficking, sometimes right in underneath our own noses. And this is Satan being bound. I would like to suggest to you that this is a future event and a real event that's a going to take place to Satan in this world. But we see four names of Satan that are mentioned there. The first is the dragon and the dragon represents his cruelty and Satan is cruel. He will take you and drive you to places you never thought you would go. Second, he's called the old serpent. That is a reference to the Garden of Eden. Specifically, it is a reference to Genesis 3.15, the first mention of the gospel, where Satan's head is crushed by the heel of Jesus. And he's also called the devil. That means he's a slanderer. He's the father of lies. And lastly, it's the name we know him most by, Satan. And that name means he's our adversary. He is our enemy. But right there, underneath verse 3, you could also write, he is gone. Now see, that does not remove sin. You and I are both born sinners. We have this sin nature inside ourselves and there's nothing we can do about it. That's why Jesus died for us. We were born. When Adam sinned, he put that curse upon all mankind, but it is the second Adam, Jesus, that came to relieve us of that curse. Sin is still here, but the tempter is removed. You see, there's gonna be people alive at this moment. There are people who did not take the mark of the beast and they lived through the tribulation. There are the tribulation saints that stayed faithful and they did not take the mark also. And they will enter the tribulation just like we are today, human beings and alive. These millennial believers that enter will be humans and they will have children. These children are going to be born into a perfect government. This ch these children will be born into absolute clarity. There will be no confusion because if you have a question, you could go ask Jesus yourself. There will literally be Jesus physically there. These people born and living in the millennium will eventually die. And when they die, they will get a new body like we will have. Some speculate, will it be a 33 year old body? It doesn't matter how close it looks to you like now. I don't care. That new body will never know the words cancer or death. We will get a new body. But in that millennium, because they're human beings, there'll still be sin. Some have said that there'll probably be no funerals that a person during the millennium will live and then their body will give out and maybe people will start to live thousands of years like they used to, and, and, or excuse me, hundreds of years like they did before. I don't know if that's all true, but what I know is Jesus will be there. Jesus will be there and it doesn't matter all the details. The only detail that matters is that you know Christ is your personal savior. Nothing's more important Nothing, no theological viewpoint, nothing matters more than you know Christ today as your personal Savior. Would you take a moment and confess to Jesus that you are a sinner? Thank Him for dying on the cross in your place and ask His 
death on the cross to be your payment for your sin. You need Jesus. And even in a perfect government, in a perfect scenario that this world was never known, you're still going to need Jesus. Number two, we can be optimistic because Jesus will reign with the saints. Jesus will reign with the saints. Look at verse four of Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thorn, thrones and they, they sat upon them. Who is the they? The they is the Old Testament saints, the New Testament, the tribulation saints. You see, there will be different levels of rulers. Let me, let me throw some things at you. The disciples will rule Israel. The Bible says in Matthew 19, 28, in Matthew 25, 21, it says that believers will rule according to faithfulness. That means that some faithful people will rule over parts of like Michigan and other people will have to rule over parts of, well, we'll say Ohio. I'm not sure which is better. Oh, I know exactly which is better. If you're not very good, you're going to have to be in charge of Cincinnati. But also it says that the martyrs of the tribulation will rule. Look at verse four with me. And judgment was given upon them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And those that reject during the tribulation, reject the one world government and the one world religion, they have their heads cut off. I'd like to suggest to you that there's only one group of people, one religious movement that kills people by cutting their heads off when they refuse to convert, and that is Islam. I believe that during the tribulation, and it's my opinion that that one world religion is some form of Islam, and some form of socialism merged together. Neither the image which hath received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Those who died in the tribulation but didn't believe, they stay in hell. Their bodies stay in the grave. Look at verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. What a horrible thing to have be said about you, that you will spend a thousand years in hell, a thousand years separated from Jesus. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is for the just. The second resurrection is for the unjust. And they will be resurrected in the next chapter. And they will stand before Jesus at that great white throne. And they will see if their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And if they are not there, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which the Antichrist and the false prophet are already there. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And lastly, saints. Saints will judge the world. It is 1 Corinthians 6, 2 that says, Do you not know that saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you. So again, my question again is, when did any of this happen? When did this take place and how are we spiritually right now judging and ruling the earth? Who is spiritually ruling over and judging the nation of Israel? Who's spiritually ruling and judging over the state of Michigan? You go to Lansing and you realize even those people there aren't taking care of this state. So who's doing that today? We have bodies like Jesus has right now. Where is a lion and a lamb laying down with each other? You see, the sheep of Matthew chapter 25, those people will enter into the millennium with physical bodies. Babies are born and there's going to be a population burnt explosion here on this earth. And what happens when a baby dies during that time period? You know, there's a lot of speculation. Some say that one of my heroes, Dr. McGee, says that moms during the millennium will get to raise babies that, that were, died before they were born here on earth. I love that thought. I think it's a great idea. There's no verse that really backs that up. But you know what? I don't know all the details of the millennium because God chose not to tell us. I only know the most important thing. Jesus is going to be here and he's going to rule. And because I know Christ is my personal savior, I'll be with Jesus. And after that fact, what more do you really need to know? Number three, the third reason to be optimistic is Jesus will stop all rebellion. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, I wrote this in my Bible right above verse 7. This is why we can't have nice things. Look at verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Why? Why does Satan have to be loosed out of it? Well, the best answer that I found is that Satan has to be judged and dealt with before eternity. But you know, the question isn't why is Satan loosed? That's not the question to ask yourself. 
The question to ask yourself is, why are there some people who haven't believed? During the millennium, not everyone will be saved, and there's going to be some that are going to join Satan and actually try to rebel against Jesus. Verse 8, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are four and four quarters of the earth. Gog. Gog is a reference to one of Noah's grandsons. Uh, they sort of populated the area around the Caspian Sea. It could be uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. It's probably Russia. I firmly believe that Gog is a reference to Russia and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. They get a lot of people to join them to go against God and to rebel against Jesus. This idea, this fact, this sure does destroy the whole, well, if we just had a perfect world, if we could just get the world to get on the same page, and if we just had a, a perfect government, you know, people would be better. If we had better education, people would be better and behave better. Here, this world, people have the world that they always wanted. They have a flawless government. They have Jesus taking care of ruling everything, and yet they still rebel against him. You know, the lesson is this. The lesson is that your issue is really a hard issue. Your issue isn't about who's in control of the government, who's in office this week and next year. Your issue isn't about poverty. Well, poverty causes crime or anything. Your issue isn't even over some sin issue. You might have even inherited and biologically predetermined. No, your issue is a heart issue. You need Christ as your personal savior because you can clean up everything around you and until you know Jesus Christ and until he cleans up what's on the inside, nothing is going to change. You see, this world is crazy. And every day it gets crazier and more insane. Truth is called a lie and lies are called truth. In Europe, a few weeks ago, they had what they call the European Games. And in the European Games, this 59-year-old man represented the nation of Finland. And he skated out onto the ice. And there's a, thing, a couple things wrong with this picture. One, he's dressed up like a woman because he calls himself transgender. But secondly, he barely knows how to skate. He wasn't chosen for his skating ability. He was chosen because he fits a quota. And as he skates out there, we were all told to say, oh, stunning and brave. We were all supposed to look past his chromosomes that say he's a man, look past his Adam's apple, look past his bone structure of his face, look past his hands and look past everything that says man. And we were told to lie to ourselves and to everyone else and say, that's a woman. And I must confess when I saw that come out and I saw this man repeatedly fall and fall because he's not a good skater and he's not a woman, I began to laugh. I thought, this is silly, this is ridiculous. Look how absurd this is. Instead of, he took the place of a lady. Ladies, when are you going to stand up and say it is not right for men to be woman face and to take places that are reserved for you? He took a place that should have been reserved for a lady who earned this spot, but he was giving it to him. He was giving it to him just because he fulfilled a quota. And at first I laughed and, I, and then I got mad as I started to realize whose daughter's place did he take? Who should have been carrying that flag? Who could have really skated? Who was a real hero to their nation? Who worked really hard? Who got bumped for this? Because of what this man under his delusion. But lastly, I'll be honest with you, I began to have my heart break. Because yeah, it was funny. Yeah, it's something to get mad about, especially as a father with little girls. But in the end, my heart broke. Because this man is under the delusion of the the usurper. This man is bought into the lie of Satan's kingdom. Satan lies. He tells us that right is wrong and wrong is right. And yes, I think he gets sort of a chuckle of himself to see how much he can get us to do. But instead of laughing at these people, instead of getting mad at what's going on, what this man needs, he needs Jesus. Because what you need is also Jesus. And as crazy as this world gets, I still have optimism because I have hope because I have Jesus. The world can embrace the insanity of Satan, but one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to set everything straight and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And how that's going to look, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't really care. 
because I know the most important thing. I know Christ is my personal Savior. And wherever Jesus is, that's where I'll be too. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. You have hope. You have a reason to be optimistic because you have Jesus. Thank you.